little under 10 years ago, I was uh, getting ready for youth group on a Wednesday night, and um, I was in Ohio, and there was a group of kids huddled around a table in the foyer, and I was passing my way through the, through the foyer and to the into the auditorium, and, and so I w- wanted to see what was going on. You know, I, I, they were over there kind of exclaiming disbelief and, and really just like making a, kind of a, a ruckus, and I'm, I'm, of course I'm curious. So I walk over to the table, and I say, guys, what's, what, what's going on? I mean, what, what's up? It was then that one of the students said, oh my gosh, Chris, you have got to try this, and they handed me one of these. Have you seen one of these before? Okay, good. Okay, some of you know what I'm talking about here. They handed me this. I looked it over, and I could tell it was some sort of a game, but I I asked, okay, uh, what is this thing? And they said they told me that it was a game called 20Q, and it was based on the game 20 Questions, and and that all you had to do was to think about something, and then the game would tell you what you were thinking. They told me that the game would ask me questions about the thing I was thinking of. It would push a button to answer yes, no, uh, maybe, or, or I don't know, or sometimes. And so I said, so you're telling me that I can think of anything in the world, and if the, I answer the, the, the questions accurately, it'll tell me what I'm thinking. And they assured me that was the case. They've been playing with this game for like 30 minutes, and every time they had guessed. And, and I mean, I was skeptical. Because sure, a bunch of middle school kids, you know, and, and high school kids, surely you can guess that. You know, they're thinking of things like ball and cat. Because middle school and high school kids aren't very smart, as we all know, right? I'm just teasing kiddos. Just teasing Ashton. She gave me the stink eye right there. But I thought, you know, maybe if I played, I could think of something much more random, much more sophisticated, and I could trick this so-called game. And so I came up with something completely random, uh, something like a duck-billed platypus or something like that. And it started working through the questions, and I quickly determined that I had indeed stumped the game. There was no question in my mind that I had stumped the game because it seemed that for every question that I answered yes to, there were about 10 questions that I answered no to. And I was thinking, there's no way this thing is going to get it right. There are way too many no's here. And it progressed through the questions, and it finally told me on that electronic display, that very thing you see there, it says, you're thinking of, or actually first it said, I think I know what you're thinking. And I scoffed, and I said, yeah, right. And then the toy said, you're thinking of a duck-billed platypus. And I threw that thing at the kid who brought it, and I said, get this black magic thing out of my face, and I ran to the auditorium as fast as I could. Because how in the world could it guess that? And, and, and of course, that little 20Q game, by the way, there's an online version, I believe, now you can play if you really want your mind blown. But it wasn't using black magic or actually reading my mind. But what it was doing is it was taking this massive amount of possibilities, anything in the world, and it was narrowing things down based on what I was answering. And so while there were some questions that I answered yes to, there were way more no questions. And as I thought about this amazing thing that this little toy had accomplished in about five minutes, I realized the power of knowing what something is not, of knowing what something is not. You see, a crucial tool in describing something to someone is helping them see what it is not. When you're, helping, when you're trying to describe someone, they might say, okay, but is it like this? No, oh, no, 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 it's not quite like this, it's more like this. And that, that helps people understand. That's, that's really how this game worked. It narrowed all these possibilities down to this duck-billed platypus by finding out what it was not. So we've spent some time, uh, you know, understanding what something is not. It sometimes helps clarify and better describe uh, what you're defining. And, and so we've spent some time describing what koinonia groups are and what they're going to be. And last week we talked about the difference between the chandelier and the Christmas lights group. That, that both are very similar. They have the same power source. They both give off light. They're, all, they're both connected. But one of them gives off light in one place, centrally located, and the other one gives off light into different different areas, kind of spreads light out a little different. And and you'll find in your bulletin, by the way, if you have your bulletin, just pull this little list out. You'll find in your bulletin a little insert with perhaps a little more clarity. I want to talk about that just for a moment. You know, this is not nearly as funny as the, if you are a red, you know, if you do this, you might be a redneck joke, but that's kind of the, the theme that we went with there. And so... If you're already active in a mission field, this is part of the Christmas Lights group. If you're already active in a mission field, in other words, if you're already doing something that you're active in from day-to-day basis, and that's something you're already doing, then you might fit well in the Christmas Lights group. If you'd like help becoming a missionary where God has placed you, 
So maybe you're not quite active yet, but you want help to figure out how you can be active as a missionary where you are, in your job, in your neighborhood, in your, in your, where you do your hobbies, that sort of thing. Then, then the Christmas light might be good for you. If you'd like to network with others to join them in their mission field, we're all in this together and we're going to network with one another so that we can build those relationships and become more effective. If you'd like to help others see the, their gifts, potentials, and opportunities. That's one thing the Christmas Light groups will do is to help see those gifts, see those potentials, see that, that, those opportunities that are before us. And if you enjoy meeting new people and building relational networks, the Christmas Light might be for you because that's kind of what it is. It's this network of relationships that we're building for the glory of God. And if you want to be a part of many mission opportunities... In other words, not just one single focus, but maybe have your, uh, your, 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 uh, your hand in a lot of pots, as it were, to figure out what's going on in different areas and be involved in a lot of different things, then perhaps the Christmas light Koinonia group is for you. On the other hand, if you like the adventure of starting a mission from scratch, that's a scary, we were talking about that in our leaders meeting this morning, that's a pretty scary thing. To start completely from scratch, not knowing any way, shape, or form where God is going to lead us until we get together and start praying and fasting and working towards that. If you like that idea of adventure and not knowing where we're heading and being a part of that. If you like to collaborate with others on big projects. If you like to work with people and kind of help uh, accomplish things, then the, the, the chandelier group might be for you. If you have trouble seeing how God wants to use you, but you sense that he's calling you to something more. Maybe you're thinking, I want to be a part of something big, something bigger than myself. I'm really not active right now in anything, but I want to be active in something, and I want to see where God is leading that. That's, that's an opportunity in the chandelier group. If you want to be a part of, a, of discerning God's vision for your team, again, as we said before, there is no predetermined purpose of the chandelier koinonia group. The group is going to meet together, and the purpose is going to be defined by the Holy Spirit and by the people within that team as they discern what God wants them to do. And if you want to join others in a single mission focus, one thing, one purpose, one goal, then the chandelier group might be for you. And so hopefully that'll help you understand a little bit more the difference between the two groups that we're going to have, the Christmas light group and the chandelier group. But today we want to once again maybe talk a little further and define the koinonia groups as a whole. And so what I want to do today is we're going to talk about what these groups are not as well as what they are using the illustrations and the, and the uh, visual aids that we brought up over the past several weeks. Let's start with the Bible. Now, each one of these things co coincides with one of our scorecard things, if you will, one of our, our, our key uh, parts of faith, obedience. And we talk about obedience. A key component to that is obeying the Bible. And so the Bible here represents obeying God's Word, of finding out what God's Word is and, and following that and, and letting that guide our lives. Now, we kind of talked about this before, but one thing these koinony groups will not be is a structured and planned Bible study. This is not going to be a group in which we set up on Tuesday nights and meet at somebody's house and have a, have a uh, conversation about a Bible study or a book of the Bible or do a, a video series or whatever the case may be. Now, there's a place for that in our congregation. We want to do that. There is a place we will continue to have Bible studies, and we want everyone to be involved in a Bible study. But this isn't the place for that. These groups are not for that. But that doesn't mean, however, that the Bible is not important in these groups. So while our K-groups won't be a structured and planned Bible study, they will be a place for action and interaction with Scripture. I like how one church compared uh, this type of action and interaction as fresh bread. You ever walked past a bakery or into a home where a fresh loaf of bread is either finishing baking or just out of the oven? Some of your mouths are watering right now, I'm guessing. When I was a kid, my mom would often bake bread, and I would be out playing in the yard or whatever, and I'd catch a smell of that bread from the outside, and I would rush in to see if it was out of the oven yet. And even if it wasn't, I would just sit in the kitchen and just wait for it to be finished because I, I really wanted to taste that bread for myself, that fresh bread. Well, in our koinonia groups, we're going to be constantly discussing God's Word in two ways. We're going to talk about what we've experienced and how God's Word spoke to us or speaks to that. Sometimes it might be negative. You know, uh, this morning I, I was on my way to work and somebody cut me off and i got to be honest with him, I flipped him the bird. We might confess that, you know, because we're going to be real in these groups. 
And then we'll say, but then I realized that when I was reading the script word, God's word later that, that you know, that was not very Christ-like, that I was not uh, loving my neighbor as myself, that I was not being slow to anger in that situation. Or maybe we'll say, you know, here's a great example of, of something that I felt like uh, an experience of, of, of Christ-likeness that somebody showed to me, and you can compare that to Scripture. So we're going to take our experience and talk about that in comparison to God's Word. But also, we're going to talk about what we've learned from God's Word and how we've experienced. It's going to go both ways. What we've experienced and how God's Word kind of speaks to that, but also uh, what we've learned from God's Word and how we've lived that out. And see, I'm convinced that through the stories of truth and the power uh, of God's Word in these, in these examples, as we, as we share these with one another, it will be like an aroma throughout our groups that will hopefully draw us each to act and interact with God's Word and experience it for ourselves. That when we see how God's Word is interacting and acting in people's lives, that we can, it'll be like fresh bread. It'll draw us to want to taste it for ourselves. A familiar verse from Psalms serves as a guide for this aspect of our Koinonia group. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Far too long, church, I think we've treated God's word as, uh, as your word is a, a memory card that I can plug into my brain. And that's not what God's word is intended to be. It's intended to be a lamp to, to guide our direction, a light for our way. And that's how we're going to approach God's word in the Koinonia groups. Then over here, the second thing, we've got the candle. And we use the candle because in Scripture, uh, a lot of times, fire or a flame is kind of used as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. And we talked about when it comes to obedience, not only do we need to obey the Bible, but we also need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and His guidance. And so what, we're gonna, what we need to know about these Koinonia groups is they are not predefined, predetermined, preplanned, or road mapped out. They're not. They're not, they're not predefined. They're not, they're, not, they're not all figured out and you just come and join with us. It's something that we've got to go along. They are Holy Spirit led in the context of the community. I think a good way to explain it is to compare a couple kind of books that I like to read when I was a kid. You've heard me talk about these before, but when I was a kid, we had a bookshelf and in the bottom of these books, uh, the bottom of this bookshelf was about 12 or 15 hardcover books that I got into once I started reading uh, a little more in depth as opposed, as opposed to all the books with uh, pictures and stuff like that. And, and so there was the Hardy Boys series. You heard of the Hardy Boys? Hardy Boys were these kid detectives and they'd go through all these different adventures. And, and when I started reading the Hardy Boys, I'd start at page one and I'd read straight through to the end of the book and the adventure was very defined. I knew exactly if I followed page one to page two and page three and page four, and pretty soon there was an adventure in that book, and all I had to do was follow along, and I would see that. But then there was another kind of book that was my favorite kind of book when I was growing up, and it was called the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Now, we never were able to do a book report on these. It always made me so mad. The teacher would never let us do book reports. She said, the only way you can do a book report is if you read it from page one to page whatever it is, at the end, straight forward through the end. And that's not the way those books worked. The way it worked is you'd read a page at the end that says, if you want to open the door and go to your right, turn to page 13. If you'd like to sit down and have dinner with this man, turn to page 12. And you do that, and then at the end of that page, it says, okay, if you want to have the, the filet mignon, then turn to page 22, and if you'd like to have the hot dog, uh, then go to page whatever. And every time, at the end of every page, there was a decision to be made, and you kind of went through, and you, and you got to choose your own adventure, as the name said. Well, while our groups are not predefined, they're not predetermined, they're not preplanned or road mapped out, they're not a Hardy Boys book. They're actually a choose-your-own-adventure journey with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There's a couple of passages that explain. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And once again, let me remind you that what Paul is saying in here is in him, y'all too are becoming built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. He's talking about the church here. 
He's saying that you together are going to be the place in which the Holy Spirit dwells and lives. Together we're the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Here's the great thing about our koinonia groups that's probably more so than anything else we've ever done before. You know, I'll be honest, a lot of times we'll do programs or we'll do something and it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the senior minister guy. He's the guy that kind of put it together, that kind of has the vision, that kind of had the leadership in it, that kind of took it and said, here's what we're going to do. Or maybe it was a, a, a teacher or a volunteer, but, but a lot of times we, we kind of depend on a single person. You see, here's the great thing about what God did for his church is that he didn't say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give two or three people in every church the gift of the Holy Spirit. And those two or three people can tell you what you should do and what God wants you to do and what direction you want to go. No, he said, anyone who comes to Christ, anyone who is saved by the blood of Jesus, anyone who accepts him as the Lord and Savior by faith, they will have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And church, I think if that's true, if you believe that, if we believe that, that not only does, do I have the Holy Spirit, but so does everyone in this room that, that have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, we need to be putting that power to use. We need to be taking that, that and using it to God's glory in our advantage. And so what we're going to be doing is allowing the Holy Spirit together in the context of community to guide us and to direct us. Another example, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And while Jesus was talking specifically to his disciples in this context, we too will be empowered and sent. And if you go through, I love the book of Acts, by the way. I love the book of Acts because it has all these adventure stories. You've got shipwrecks and you've got stonings and you've got all these different arguments and different things and, 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 and people coming to Christ. And, and what we see is Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And then the rest of Acts shows us how that happened, how it started in Jerusalem, how it moved out to Judea and Samaria, and how eventually with Paul went to the ends of the earth. And, and the funny thing about that was is that there were a lot of twists and turns in that story if you read the book of Acts. And I believe wholeheartedly that God is saying to us with our coin, through our koinonia groups, he's saying, I'm going to send you out. You're going to be my witnesses through the power of the Holy Spirit in your communities, in your state, to the ends of the earth. And the twists and turns are going to be an adventure that can only be found by following and obeying the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the bean jar. This one, we, we moved from obedience in these two things to, to the idea of community here. And if you remember correctly, we talked about community has two elements according to what Scripture says. It should have koinonia which is that fellowship and love that's developed between uh, one another, but it also should be inclusive, that there should be people who don't uh, know, yet, know Jesus yet. There should be people who aren't quite like us in that community. And so we have here, again, a bunch of different kind of beans, and they're all in the same. And by the way, there are like a bunch of pinto beans. You know, I think maybe, I, I, maybe if church people were pinto beans, a lot of us are pinto beans, and it's okay. We're going to be together. But there's also some, uh, some, some kidney beans in there, it looks like. And kidney beans have a whole different background, a whole different life. They're not different than us. They don't look like us. They don't sound like us. And then you've got some lima beans in there, and you've got some black-eyed peas in there, and you've got all these different things. And that's kind of the way we believe that God has called us to be in community. But there are two things that our small groups have tended to be in the church as a whole that these koinonia groups will not be. Two things that I believe, if you look back on the history, not only of our congregation, but in the Church of, of America, when you talk about small groups, they're usually one of two things. One of them is they're a holy huddle, and this, our koinonia groups will not be holy huddles. You know what a holy huddle is? It's when all God's get, people get together, and they just huddle up and have a nice little party and eat cake and, and have a good time, and then they go back home, and then they come back again, and they huddle up again, and they go back home, and they huddle up again. And a lot of times that's what our small groups have been. They've been holy huddles. And that's not what these koinonia, koinonia groups are going to be. They are also, though, on the other hand, are not going to be outreach events. That's the other thing we've kind of done. We've kind of said we're going to organize a small group to go out and to reach people for Jesus. And so over here we have our holy huddles, you know, where we maybe do a Bible study or we have a prayer time or whatever the case would be. And over here we've got our outreach events, which are meant to go out and to reach people for, people for Jesus. And... Our coin of the year groups are not going to fit in either one of those categories. Instead, 
these groups are going to be both at the same time. Our koinonia groups are going to be both for the benefit of disciples and people who are not yet disciples. A great guiding scripture for this characteristic is the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. Then Jesus said to them and came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, if our koinonia groups are a mixture of people who don't yet know Jesus and those who do already know Jesus, then a culture of discipleship that reflects Jesus' command in this passage can be created. It's going to be a culture of closeness. I, I got to tell you, I got to be honest with you. If we're going to do what Jesus said, if we're going to make disciples, if we are going to make more and better disciples, it is going to require us to come in contact with one another. You, you know the old verse. You've heard it before. As iron sharpens iron. Iron doesn't sharpen iron from our arm's length away. It sharpens iron from right there. Right there, touching right there, that closeness. And so there's got to be this culture of closeness with our koinonia groups, but it's also a a culture where Christ is always with us. Jesus promised us that he'll always be there to the very end of the age. And really, that's the right way to read that passage where Jesus said, and and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's this promise that Jesus will be with us. But it's also kind of a reality of Christ's community, the church. That we're going to be there with all different kinds of beans, if you will. And right in the midst of that group, that, that jar of beans, is going to be Christ always. And the great thing is, is that when you intermingle beans who want to be like Jesus with Jesus, they're going to become more like Jesus. And when you intermingle people who don't yet know Jesus with Jesus, there's a good chance they're going to want to be like Jesus as well. And so when people who, are, who don't know Jesus are a part of that, new disciples are made. There's that closeness that, re, that brings us closer to God and, and helps us sharpen one another. But then there's also that presence of Christ that will help us to make more disciples as well. Let's talk about the rocking chair for a little bit. Now, this was uh, obedience. Here we were to community. Now this is to mission. And one of the aspects of mission that we've talked about that is so vital, according to what Scripture says, is this, that it's incarnational. And, and really, that's just a fancy word of saying that we are in the flesh. That we're in the flesh. And that's the kind of, of mission that we should be uh, undertaking in our congregation. And so it's important for us to understand that our koinonia groups will not and are not going to be drive-by groups. You've heard me say that phrase before, I'm sure, drive-by Let me explain what that is, though. For too long, the church's service and evangelism efforts have been devoid of relationship and limited to isolated incidents. And so what we do is we have drive-by service projects that we'll go down and we'll feed the homeless for a day and we'll, we'll, we'll hand them out food, but we don't really get to know them. Or we'll go and we'll, we'll, we'll take, be a part of uh, some uh, you know, thing where we give shoes or, 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 or school bags for kids, but we don't get to know the families we take it to. Or we, we hand money to somebody to help them do something, but we don't, really, we, we don't really know them. We don't really spend any time with them. Or maybe we'll go and we'll mow somebody's lawn, but we don't really like, have coffee with them and hang out with them. It's just all these things are drive-by. We go in, we do something good, and then we leave. And you know what? I'm not saying anything that, there's, that, that, that that's all bad. We need to serve others in every, every way, shape, or form that we can. But the reality is, is that that's not how God called us to serve. God did not call us to drive by service projects. By the way, the same thing is true for evangelism. We have been taught and trained uh, in the church over the last 50 years or so how to get in quick and get out quick, right? To get in quick and to preach the gospel, to share, and we get this, we've got, you know, napkin evangelism and the five fingers of salvation, and we've got all these neatly packaged evangelistic kind of speeches that we give. And so, you know, it's like always look for that opportunity. Maybe go knock on a door or go to the mall and say, if, you're gonna, if you die tonight, are you going to heaven or hell? And then they, when that opens the door, we can start talking about this. And, and then uh, if they accept Jesus when we're right there, then we can say, yay, that's awesome. We can write their name down and we can send it to a church somewhere. Or if they don't accept Jesus, then we say, well, we've done our job anyway. The reality is that Jesus didn't just call us to preach the word, to share the good news. He called us to do that as a part of something bigger and more important, that we are to make disciples. 
And church, you can't make disciples in a drive-by. You can't go to the mall this afternoon and make a disciple by the time you're done. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes relationship. And so our koinonia groups should be with one another and those who we come in contact with. This is based on the example of Christ. You've heard us talk about it before. John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love the, the Peterson version that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And then in John chapter 20, verses 21, you got John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus came in the flesh. From John chapter 1 to John chapter 20, we see how Jesus was in the flesh. And then in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I love how Hugh Halter put it in his book, Flesh. He said this, he said, I've read thousands of pages in a truckload of books about the incarnation, and not once have I heard any significant commentary on the fact that Jesus left his king's palace in heaven and moved to, a, to the cheapest side of the tracks, bought himself a little shack next to the rest of us, put a rocking chair on the front porch and a barbecue in the backyard, and he became our neighbor. He says, that's big news, and we can't move deeply into incarnated life unless we learn how to do home like Jesus did. I love that picture of Jesus leaving his palace, leaving heaven, is, and, and not considering so, equality with God something to be grasped, as Philippians chapter 2 says. But he, he moved in the neighborhood. He got the cheapest place he could find on the wrong side of the tracks. And he put a rocking chair on the front porch and a barbecue in the back porch. And he went out there and he had people come and he was with people. He was with people all the time. And our Ko koinonia groups need to be a place of listening of engaging and just being with each other as we spur one another on to love and good deeds, as well as being with those who need the gospel in every area of their lives. And we need to be as welcoming and inviting as a rocking chair on the front porch. Then we have the family picture. The family picture kind of represents another part of mission. It's this idea that, it, that, that mission is um, it, non-compartmentalized. For too long, the church has said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my church part over here, my work part over here, my family part over here. Or we might say, here's my church in missions, even, even church, we've said, here's our missions committee, and here's our outreach committee, and here's our outreach events. And the reality is, according to what God's Word says, is that everything we do should be surrounded around, uh, around this idea of mission. That everything we do as a, as a church should have mission ha at, at the forefront, Everything we do, not only that, but everything we do in our life should as well. And so here's what we, one of the most important things we want you to understand about the Koinonia groups. One of the most important things, and if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this because this is so vital to your expectations of what is to come, is that they are not a program and they are not an add-on. The Koinonia groups are not a program and they are not an add-on. They're not a program. They're not an add-on. And for these groups to become what God intends, they must be a regular part of the rhythms of our life. They can't just be something that we schedule. Uh, for us to accomplish all the things God intended, these koinonia groups, they cannot be limited to a once a week or so meeting. They've got to become a part of our very lives. And some of you are going, I am so busy already. Are you kidding me? How in the world? Well, you see, that's what God called us to, is not to just add something to our schedule, but to maybe reorient our lives, not to koinonia groups, but to a way of life in which God is glorified in everything, and that everything we do is a part of his mission. They have to become a very part, part of our very lives. The best scripture to help us picture this principle is one we've used a lot late, lately, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And notice that this passage of Scripture says very clearly that this church didn't meet a couple times a week and everything was good. 
They didn't have church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday or men's group on Thursday or women's group on Tuesday or whatever the case may be. They just, just did life together. And everything they did was for the glory of God. And by the way, let's remember that who this is referring to. This is not referring to a church of 75, 80 people. This is referring to a church of 3,000 people. 3,000 people. And so here's the reality of that. The practical reality of this is that if they did life together, how in the world could 3,000 people have meaningful relationships with 2,999 other people? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so here's what we need to understand is that they did some things together. They didn't meet together every day as a group of 3,000, but they were with together, with each other all the time. And so that means that, you know, you're going to have a koinonia group that you're going to be a part of. And there are going to be 20 to 40 people in that group. That's what we're hoping. And in that 20 to 40 people, guess what? Not everybody has to meet together all the time for us to be with one another. It means we just do life together with others that are a part of our group, that are a part of our congregation. That's something that becomes a regular part of life. We want our koinonia groups to look like Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. So while they're not a program, they're not an add-on, they are actually a part of life that are both organized and organic. Let me explain what we mean by that. Organized in that some things will absolutely be scheduled. Some of you are freaking out going, well, how am I know when I'm supposed to be there if you're not going to put a schedule and tell us when we're going to? No, no. Sometimes we're going to say, be there at Tuesday at 7 o'clock. There's got to be organized activities in these things. That's going to happen. But the other part that is a part of our expectation is that sometimes you just need to get together with a brother and sister in Christ. Sometimes you just need to get together with someone who doesn't yet know Jesus just because life kind of draws you together. That maybe you're all going to go see your kids play together. Or maybe you're going to watch the game together. Or maybe you both like to watch some zombie TV show. And instead of doing it by yourself, you're going to do it with somebody else. Or, or maybe you like NASCAR and you want to hang out with Alvin for a while. That's okay. Whatever it is, it's organic. You know, we all got to eat. We all got to do this. And so we got to find these ways just to kind of fit together, just to kind of work together, just to kind of be together. And yes, sometimes we need to say, uh, everybody come to my house at 6 o'clock on Sunday. And sometimes we just need to say, oh, yeah, you're going to watch that? Well, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Oh, you're going to go out to, to eat? Well, we were going to. Let's go. And the reason we use the family picture to show this principle is that we really want our Koinonia groups to work like an extended family. We want them to work like an extended family. You know, sometimes we have scheduled times in my family to get together. One of those times is our annual deer camp. I was talking to Donna Kay earlier about when I was going to be gone for the rest of the year. She goes, tell me when you're not going to be here so I can make sure to be here. I don't know what that means, but... She said, tell me, when we talked about it, I said, well, she said, I know you're going to be gone in, in November. I said, yep, t- you know, two Sundays, every November, we're together with my family in Northwest Oklahoma. It's scheduled. But you know, sometimes we just kind of get together because we are together. You know, when we're at there, you know, sometimes it just naturally happens, especially like with our family here, extended family here. You know, Lindy and Joe, is our, that's Carrie's sister, and Joe and Lindy are our family. And so what happens is sometimes we say, let's have dinner together at this day. And sometimes we just call each other and say, hey, we're going to swim. Want to come over? Isn't that how it works with family? That sometimes you have schedules and sometimes you just do it? That's what we're talking about with these koinonia groups. The scheduled part's not going to be too hard. Although we are going to have to fit it in. The organic part is going to take some work. Then, of course, we have the lights. And that's the third part of the mission. We talk about this idea of holistic mission. You know, before we've kind of said, here's our evangelism, and here's our, our helping poor people, and here's our, our uh, whatever the case may be. And it, it's, it's all holistic. It's all together. And the guiding scripture here is Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse thir- uh, 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And so they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And we've talked a lot about that last week, so I'm not going to get too far into that. But there is one thing we need to absolutely understand is that these koinonia groups are not, not just for you. I can tell you one thing. If you think that these koinonia groups are going to 
exist for your pleasure and happiness, I will tell you the same thing I tell my kids. We're not here to make you happy. Now, we want to be built. We want to grow. We want to, to develop. But here's what these Koinonia groups are for. There's three things. The first thing is these Koinonia groups, they are for us as disciples. They are. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that these are not for you at all. But what I am saying is that we've decided that this is, we've really felt like God is leading us to say this is the primary vehicle in which discipleship will happen. This is the primary vehicle in which our church people, our congregation, our church family will grow in Christ. And so absolutely it's for us as disciples. But it's also, it's also for others as we shine our light. We need to, I mean, if we took out the light aspect of our koinonia groups, if we took away the mission aspect, there would be a gaping hole in our obedience to God. And so these groups are going to be built around and, and functioned around mission and reaching people for Jesus and, and having that ultimate motive of, of letting people see the light of Christ in their life so that they can too come to him. And so that's always going to be a focus for us. But then, of course, at the very end, when you put us as disciples, us or, and then others, as they come to know Christ, ultimately, these Koinonia, Koinonia groups are going to be for the glory of God. And everything we do, again, it's not for our entertainment, for our joy. It's for God to be glorified in our congregation in a way that, that he's never been glorified before. In a way that we can grow more and more and more and more in him. And so, as I've prayed since the time I got here at this congregation that God will grow this church in such a way that can only be attributed to him, not to a preacher, not to a program, not to a building, but to our God. And so these are some of the characteristics of our Koinonia groups, that, that our Bible uh, involvement, action, interaction will be like fresh bread, that, that we can talk about that in our lives in a way that will draw one another to want to experience God's word more, that, that, our, uh, that the candle shows that this is going to be kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure book, that God's going to guide us, and together we're going to help discern what God is calling us to do, that, that we have this, this bean jar, which is this mixed up close environment uh, of discipleship for the glory of God, that we've got the rocking chair that, that includes inviting uh, a part of being a part of each other's lives, as well as the people we want to reach for Christ, that we just sit and be with people and chat and get to know them. And then, of course, the family portrait, that the idea that there's an organized part, a scheduled part of life, but there's also an organic part of life. And in both areas, God needs to be at the center of those for us. And then, of course, the, the lights and uh, that the groups are designed to shine the light of God. But there's one more visual that I want to show you that we need to explain what these groups will or will not be. It's a crock pot. Crock pot. We'll put that right there. You see, these koinonia groups, let me tell you what they will not be. They will not be a quick fix or instantly successful. Too many times I've heard church programs or events or whatever as here's the next big thing that's going to fix our problems as a church. And here you are listening to your preacher say, uh uh, it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be quick. It's not going to be instantly successful. It's not as if the day we launch these groups that all of our issues are, are going to be fixed, that all of our problems are going to be solved, that people are going to be coming through our doors. And we're going to have to, you know, it's not what we're saying at all. We don't want to oversell these groups. They're not going to be easy. They're not going to be perfect. But they are going to be like this crock pot in a couple of ways. The first thing is that it's going to take time, and that's okay. It's going to take time, and that's okay. We live in a microwave culture, and we want instant results. We want it, and we want it now. But some of the best things in life take time. In fact, I would say a lot of the most best things in life take time. I don't know about you, but if I had my choice between a, between a roast that's been simmered in a crock pot for hours versus a roast that's been thrown in the microwave for seven minutes on high. <laughs> you get that, thank you. I think you're going to choose the same thing too, right? 
And the reality is, is that you can throw a roast in the microwave on high for, I don't know, 7, 10, 15 minutes, something like that, and it will be done. You won't get salmonella from it, I promise you, if you can bite into it. But boy, you put a pot roast in a crock pot with some potatoes and some carrots and some, and Patsy's ringing her watch there because she's hungry. If you put that in a crock pot, it's going to be wonderful. Only one is, both might be done, microwave and crock pot. One might, both might be done, but only one is done right. This is actually reflective of Jesus' disciples, his own disciples. Uh, you know, you think about those disciples, they weren't mature. The church was not born the minute Jesus called them. It wasn't as if he said, okay, Matthew, come and come on, Peter, I'll make you a fisher of men. And all of a sudden, boom, they were mature disciples. And, and then the church was born. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the church took over the world. That's not how it worked. It took time to mature them. It took time to grow them. In fact, you look through it, even after Jesus ascended to heaven, Peter still had some things messed up. Even after that, he still made some mistakes and didn't quite grasp it. Even when Jesus is ascending, that verse I read earlier, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they're like, okay, Jesus, you're going to ascend to heaven. Are you ready to restore the kingdom fully? And Jesus said, no, not quite. That's not for you to know about. Just do your job. And so it took time to develop those men, and it will take time for us to develop our community and to be developed in obedience and mission as well. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But there's a second way that our Koinonia groups will be like this crock pot is that they will be messy, and that's okay. And I have to give you the disclaimer. My wife told me that I had to tell you that she actually added mess to this crock pot, that it's not normally how messy it is at our house. But I'll tell you, we use a crock pot a lot at our house, and they get messy. They boil over. You spill things on them. They get kind of up underneath there in the hot part, and they get cooked on, and it just, it just gets messy. And, and we believe that these koinonia groups will be crucial in our health and growth as a church moving forward. But it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be perfect. It's not all going to be sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes it's going to be baked on mess in our lives and in our church. This reminds me of the church of the first century. You know, if I could replicate what happened from the day of Pentecost on in the first 300 years, if I could find out a way to replicate that, I would be on every cover of every magazine, Christian magazine in the world, maybe even uh, Time and everything else too. Because what happened there was Pentecost happened and the church exploded, by the way, by doing some of the things that we are going to be doing in our, in, our, in our Koinonia groups. Exactly the same things. But anyway, that church exploded and it grew. And you, we often idealize the ter- first church, right? The, the, the first century church. We often look at that. And we look at Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. We say, wow, can you imagine how awesome it was and, and how great it was and how amazing it was? And then you turn to some of Paul's writings. And let's just be blunt about it. He's talking about a guy having sex with his, mother, his father's wife in the church, not in the church, but in the church, in the congregation as a part of that. This place was messy. This first century church, it was not perfect. It was not that the day of Pentecost came, they exploded, and everybody was singing kumbaya, and it was lovely, and there was sunshine and rainbows, and that's why it exploded. Let me, let me tell you something, church. The initial growth of the church was not because the initial church was perfect. Quite the contrary. Read Corinthians. Read the stories that are the things that Paul was chastising the church for, some of the dissension, some of the the, the sin that was going on. And so the reality is, I hope we don't have to have that kind of letter written to us, by the way. But the truth is that it was messy. And not not only was it messy because of mistakes and sin and that sort of thing, but it got messy because of persecution. That right when things started to look great and and the church was born, there are 3,000 and there's another couple thousand and it's just growing and growing and the Lord's adding to their number daily. And all of a sudden what God does is he picks up the church like like a, a, a dandelion that's gone to seed and God goes and sends the church everywhere because of persecution. And so the reality is, is that it's going to be messy when we do this. There's going to be growing pains. There's going to be dissension at times that we have to deal with. There are going to be times that, because I'm telling you something, church, this is something I really believe wholeheartedly that God has ordained and that is built for the glory of God and the success and the growth of this community of faith. And 
when we move in the direction that makes waves for God's kingdom, there's an enemy that is against us. And he's going to kick it into overdrive when we start daring to be brave and bold for his kingdom. So now what? Now what for you? That's the question, right? What, what, what's next? Well, I'm just going to ask you to do three things. First of all, I want you to pray. Pray for one another. Pray for these groups. Pray for the glory of God to be shown through us. Pray that for God's wisdom and guidance in everything that we do. Pray, pray, pray. Second thing I want you to do is ask questions. This opportunity we've got on, on Wednesday is a great opportunity to do that. Our, our dinner, our, our launch lunch, is actually going to be a time when you can talk because we're going to have our Koinonia group leaders kind of dispersed throughout, and you can ask tough questions and have deep discussions about what's to come. If you don't get something, you don't understand it, we want you to ask questions. But the last thing we want you to do is to trust God, trust the leadership of our church, and just jump in. Just jump in. Like we talked about last week, it's kind of like a movie you only get to see a trailer for. That's what we're doing right now. We're showing you the trailer of the movie. But if we just jump in and trust that God will be glorified, I really believe that God will honor that. And while it won't be easy, it won't be clean, it won't be quick, God is going to transform us as people, as a congregation. Let's pray. God, I thank you for wake-up calls. I thank you for the wake-up call you gave to this congregation and, and the way that each one in this room has responded to you in their own lives and as a part of this congregation. And Lord, we are embarking about, upon something that we believe that you have guided us to and, and led us to. This is for your glory and your glory alone and that you will use these koinonia groups as a tool to grow, grow us closer to you and, and to bring others to you for the first time. But God, help us to have a clear expectation of what we must do. Lord, help us to just forgive us, God, for, for watering down your expectations for us. And help us to reclaim the expectations you've set. Understanding, Lord, that you didn't call us to to those expectations because we have to follow some checklist or because there's some list of rules we got to do to please you, but that you've said that if we follow Christ, if we take up our cross, if we give up everything, including our lives, our homes, our schedules to you, that you will give us life and life more abundant. That you'll give us life to the full through Christ Jesus. And Lord, help us to trade the aspects and parts of our life that are not destined for your glory, that are not for your purposes, that are not for the full life you called us to, to trade that for the ones that are. That we might become together, come together as a community of faith, a family of believers that are obedient, that are inclusive of others and growing together as a community and that are focused on partnering with you in your mission. God, go ahead of us. Go ahead of us and bring us to you. And for all your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.